Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Listen and Learn, Podcasting Sustainable Food Systems Research. My name is Danielle Braun. I'm a Laurier alumna and alumni relations officer at Laurier, and I will be your moderator today. On behalf of alumni relations, I want to thank you for staying connected to Laurier, and I look forward to learning alongside all of you today. Before we get started, I will share some tips for navigating today's webinar. You will notice on your control panel that there's a tab for questions. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please let us know through the question tab and I will help you. Likewise, if you have any questions about the topic for our presenters, please enter them in the question tab at any time. We'll be collecting questions throughout the presentation and we'll answer them at the end of the session. So I know there's a lot of wonderful material to cover today. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenters, Lane Young and Amanda DiPatista. Over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks Danielle. Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, and we really, before we start, we'd love to uh, thank Danielle and Alumni Relations for inviting us to host this webinar today. We're really, really delighted to have a chance to tell you about our podcast, um, Handpicked Stories from the Field. Before we start, um, we thought we'd give you a quick outline for the next hour or so. Um, so we're just going to start, uh, we're going to give you some context for our podcast. Um, since you've uh, registered for the, the webinar, we assume that you've probably encountered handpicked in some way, even if it's just through the description, the webinar description. Uh, so we thought we would start with um, a definition of sustainable food systems. Um, and because we only have about an hour, for today and we'd like to leave some time for questions, it's gonna be a real quick sort of high level introduction to sustainable food systems uh, and the work that we do at the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Um, from there, we'll give you a quick introduction to what we do uh, with our research podcast, Handpicked Stories from the Field, uh, and give you some tips and tricks for um, how you might create a podcast of your own, uh, specifically a research podcast. So we'll talk a little bit about working with researchers to tell really good stories and um, walk you through what makes uh, an effective uh, research story. Um, from there, we're going to use our latest episode, uh, which is called We Are All Shepherds of the Data, Food Technological and Data Sovereignty, um, as an example of a good research story. Um, that episode was just released on Monday, so we'll have some clips to share with you um, of our conversation with uh, Teresa Schumelis, the director of Open Food Network. Um, but first, before we start all of that, um, we'd like to tell you just a little bit about ourselves. Um, so, Lane, perhaps you'd like to start? Sure, yeah. Uh, so, my name is Lane Young. I'm a PhD candidate at Laurier. I work with the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. My research is focused on women in urban agriculture in Quito, Ecuador. Um, and I'm also a contract teaching faculty for the um, Geography and Environmental Studies program. And as I said, my name is Amanda DiBattista. I am the project coordinator for the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems, uh, where my job is to focus on effective research communications and uh, research administration. Uh, in addition to producing handpicked, I also help researchers adapt their, their work for different audiences like policymakers, uh, other food system advocates, and the general public. Um, and I come to this work with a background in the environmental humanities and education. So my interest is always in good storytelling and, uh, and new ways of teaching about research. Um, as we mentioned a little bit just now, um, Lane and I both work out of the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems, which is a research center at Laurier that is run by director, uh, Dr. Allison Blake Palmer. The LCSFS, which is a tricky acronym we know, but how we affectionately uh, refer to the center, includes research advocates here at Laurier and around the world, um, as well as students, staff, and community partners. We have tons of different projects and our work is sort of um, all over the world, but we have a few major projects that you may have encountered before or that you'll see um, if you head to our website. Um, there's a little bit more information there on these projects. Um, one is a large partnership grant called FLEDGE, uh, which is, stands for Food Locally Embedded, Globally Engaged, uh, in, which is a, a partnership of 
uh, over 90 researchers and community partners um, that look at building sustainable food systems. Um, and there, uh, Dr. Blake Palmer has also recently required, uh, acquired the UNESCO Chair on Food, Biodiversity, and Sustainability Studies, which is a really interesting um, and dynamic opportunity for um, the LCSFS and the Laurier community to engage uh, with um, policymakers and UNESCO chairs around the world. Um, our podcast, Handpicked, uh, is, is primarily supported by the LCSFS, uh, but also receives support from the Balsillie School of International Affairs and CG and the Research Office at Laurier. Um, and all of our episodes focus on research or advocacy work taking place through the LCSFS. Um, the LCSFS brings together researchers from across Laurier and larger food systems to explore and try to address environmental, social, and economic challenges that are facing global food systems. So that's sort of like the bulk of the work that we do. Um, food systems are an effective lens for understanding and acting on some of the most pressing issues of our time um, because everybody eats. So it's something that everybody can relate to. Um, and we are uh, really interested in the way that we can use food systems to drive change on uh, all in all sorts of areas, including food security, climate change, water quality, waste, and energy. Um, the vision of the LCSFS is to conduct research into those into sustainable food systems that's grounded in practice and in theory, and then to share that knowledge through local, national, global networks to create opportunities for real food systems change. That means we work directly with communities um, to help identify and build the food systems that they want. So Handpicked uh, is, a pro is produced out of the Center for Sustainable Food Systems, uh, and we work directly with those researchers and community partners to translate their research about sustainable food systems into stories that anyone can listen to and understand. Um, our audience is a, the general public, but it's usually, our listeners tend to be already engaged in, in thinking about food systems or interesting, interested in how they can make change in their own uh, in their own food systems locally. Our aim is to bring the voices of those working in the field directly to the listener with some narration along the way to fill in the gaps or explain concept, complex, complex, <laughs> sorry, complex concepts. Lane and I write, host, produce, and edit handpicked with the support of Heather Reed and Allison Blake Palmer at the LCSFS and a few of our Laurier students. So, um, as Amanda said, we uh, will briefly speak about what a sustainable food system is. Um, but first, we need to start about what is a talk about what is a food system. So, um, at the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems, we look at food all the way from the seed, so when it's first produced, all the way to the compost heap, or you know, getting rid of the waste of food, and everything in between. So, you know, we're looking at all the production pieces, all of the agriculture pieces, um, some of the environmental impacts of those practices, um, looking at how um, the labor standards and income of our food producers and food workers across the food chain. Um, we're interested in processing, uh, distribution of food, marketing and selling of food, um, and then consumption. So uh, actually eating that food, who has access to it, and then how do we waste, how do we dispose of waste in the household, but also throughout this food chain. Uh, waste is a really important part of a food system. Um, and the food system allows us it provides us with an important place where we can actually start to think about sustainability um, more broadly. Uh, so a sustainable food system, which is what we're uh, aspiring towards at the LCSFS, um, looks at uh, some of the problems of the food system. So uh, as many of us know, there's food can be a big part of some of the, the world's biggest issues. Agriculture production um, accounts for nearly 40% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide and also contributes to some species loss and, and deforestation along the way. Uh, there's more than 820 million people around the world who are food insecure. Um, you know, in Canada, that looks like one in eight adults and one in six children don't have enough food uh, for themselves and their families. Um, and, you know, we're seeing obviously that um, there's different groups of people that have more challenges when it comes to food insecurity. So in Canada, 
it's likely to be higher in black and indigenous communities um, and especially in the north where we see um, obviously issues with food um, access due to cost of food. Um, <clears throat> so the researchers and the community partners at the LCF Cefez uh, are working towards changing the food system um, and imagining how this food system can be more sustainable. Um, and one of the ways we, we look at this sustainability is through um, five pillars of sustainability. Uh, the first being social justice. Um, so social justice di dimensions, so looking at how uh, power is distributed in the food system, who makes decisions, who benefits from these decisions, who benefits from this system in general. Um, ecological regeneration, so how can we produce food in a way that's good for the planet, that good for the planet that doesn't uh, contribute more to climate change? How do we, how do we um, preserve biodiversity in our world? Um, we obviously want to think about health and well-being of, of the citizens uh, on this earth, how we can um, ensure that everyone has access to nutritious foods, uh, how do we promote health with food, um, looking at local economic viability, so how can we better support local economies, um, shorten our food chains, um, create jobs across the food system, um, and really think about how we can, uh, you know, make that link between production and consumption a bit, a bit smaller. Uh, and then engaging citizens. So how do we engage with diverse groups of people and include that, include those people in policy and decision making? Um, you know, we want to imagine and create better food systems, but we need to actually include those that are affected by the food system um, in our solutions. Um, and again, that's a very brief uh, and probably very fastly spoken uh, way of describing a sustainable food system. Uh, but you can find out more information in the first episode that we have of Handpicked, where um, Dr. Allison Blay Palmer, who is the director of the LCSFS, as we said before, um, really speaks through some of these definitions and uh, we hear from people across our uh, network as well. So if you're interested in learning more, please uh, listen to our first episode. <laughs> so a food system that incorporates those pillars of sustainability that Lane just outlined is a food system that is fair, healthy, localized, ecologically regenerative, and inclusive. So it's a food system in which everybody has access to food that is healthy and culturally appropriate and produced in a sustainable way so it doesn't negatively impact our, our world any further. Sustainable food systems researchers and advocates are addressing the interconnected issues that we've outlined so far. So poverty, inadequate access to food, uh, the poor quality and uh, of, of food, um, wide scale environmental degrada degradation, et cetera, uh, by community scale initiatives that try to increase social, economic and environmental sustainability. Specifically, Resilient and sustainable food systems facilitate social justice, they create prosperous economies, they support ecological stewardship, and they demonstrate the potential for participatory democracy. So ways that citizens and practitioners and policymakers and academics can all participate in creating a system that is more sustainable and more fair. Um, in the wake of COVID-19, we're really seeing just how vital a, a resilient food system is. I'm sure everybody um, can imagine, can remember um, empty store shelves and can imagine how food access as people have lost jobs or um, have lost access to social um, uh, ways of, of uh, accessing food for when um, in an emergency situation, uh, as those have sort of disappeared or become more stressed, you can imagine how important a resilient food system is. Uh, sustainability goals come together and come to life when we start to think about how to transform food systems. So in the work that happens at the LCSFS, um, for example, uh, one of our researchers is working in the Northwest Territories. His name is uh, Dr. Andrew Spring, and he works directly with uh, the Kogitu First Nation in the tiny community of Kakisa in the, North, in the Northwest Territories. And they work to, he works directly with communities to find ways to adapt to climate change uh, through sharing of traditional knowledge, through things like on the land camps, uh, using technology like GIS maps to combine science and science knowledge and traditional knowledge to uh, map the ways that the land is changing in as a result of climate change, uh, and 
to find new techniques like growing potatoes and fire bricks. So introducing different things into these systems to build the, a sustainable food system that the community wants. So these are all very local community driven initiatives that uh, our, our researchers are working with. Um, and if you wanna hear a little bit more about Andrew's work um, and that example of the Northwest Territories and how they're changing uh, food systems there, um, you can listen to uh, episode three and four of Handpicked. So the interesting thing about a sustainable food system is that they are aspirational. We can always, always become more sustainable. Um, and right now, as our, our current food system is, is pretty broken, it is based on large scale uh, mono culture, uh, agriculture, with lots of chemical inputs that's really terrible for the environment, um, a large uh, multi or large corporate retailers, uh, multinational corporate retailers hold a lot of power. So there's a real um, huge power dynamic that's happening in our food system. And we have a long way to go to even come close to meeting the, the pillars of sustainability that Lane outlined earlier. However, We've also seen a real shift uh, towards the idea of sustainable food system uh, and, and a, real, um, a real desire to know where our food is coming from and to use food as a way to address some of these larger challenges. Um, I think that uh, there, our research shows and the growing, our growing networks really show that um, the momentum is growing and um, there is this interest is growing and that is really encouraging for us and makes us um it really helps us to see how handpicked can have uh can play an active role in sharing this information uh even further beyond our networks um and again as as lane mentioned um if you'd like to hear a little bit more about how we that we imagine sustainable food systems episode one is an amazing place to start Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit now about the food system, what, what a sustainable food system might look like, what we're aspiring towards at the center. Um, and now we wanna sort of change directions a little bit and um, speak to you all about um, using podcasts for research dissemination. So um, as a lot of you probably know, um, one of the more challenging aspects of re research is the dissemination process. So getting it out to the world um, and getting it out in an accessible way. Uh, you know, we always want to be, we always want to consider how we can ensure that the work that we've been doing actually promotes development of new knowledge and, you know, makes changes to the very problems we've identified within our research. Um, and as someone who's doing research myself and also someone who is uh, working on a podcast episode about my research, um, you know, I often struggle with the inaccessibility of academic publications. So a lot of the work that I do is community-based research. So some of the folks that I work with wouldn't even be able to access any of the articles that I've published because they're behind paywalls or other barriers. Um, so with podcasting, my work can be shared with a, a larger group of people. Um, it's more accessible. And, you know, those that want to learn more can actually reach out to me to, to get more resources and like we can expand that knowledge that way and it also creates uh, potential for more partnerships. So um, the researchers that we work with at Handpicked are, you know, practice very regular community-based research. It's all kind of all of what we do at the center is community-based. Uh, so they're working with community partners to collect data. Um, uh, but, you know, academics can sometimes struggle to put their research into um, words that everybody can understand. So podcasting allows us to create a story that we tell about the research that, you know, makes it more accessible, but also often more palatable for, um, for everyone. <laughs> So um, we have identified through our work that there are um, many challenges to sharing research. Um, there are obviously language barriers. Um, you know, when you're an academic, uh, you're often required to use different specialized language um, when you're speaking to your peers. Um, and, you know, like moving between two languages, it can be really difficult to translate some of that specialized knowledge that you have to other audiences and in a way that, you know, makes uh, makes sense for everybody. Um, it's a skill that requires time and patience, and it's something that podcasting can really help with. Um, 
there also can be an inability to um, distill research findings for a general audience. So sometimes it can be hard to summarize your research findings without losing uh, the nuances or the meaning of your work. Um, and it can be really challenging to cut a, say, 300-page thesis into a soundbite for um, something like a blog post or, uh, you know, a soundbite for a podcast or something like that. So researchers are often asked to do these types of things, but um, not all have those skills and are not as, as effective as they could be. Um, as I mentioned before, paywalls, um, many of the much of the work that gets published in academic journals, um, something that we're required to do to advance our careers, um, you know, aren't accessible to anybody who's not in academia. As we all know, often they're accessible only through paid, uh, paid subscriptions to these journals. Um, and, you know, once we start a research project, it can be really hip and in the news and exciting, um, but eventually, um, you know, our public, the public's attention is very limited. And sometimes um, well, by the time we're actually done our research, uh, it can be hard to sell to, to folks because maybe it's not something that it, it is interesting anymore. Um, and also I think we can all uh, admit that research results can sometimes be very boring. And um, that is definitely a challenge to, to sharing research. So with, um, with research podcasts, one of the main goals is to help overcome these barriers that I've mentioned. Uh, using a podcast, we can share knowledge in maybe a more casual way, it's free, and we can share it with interested communities or interested people. Um, there's something really interesting about hearing research directly from a researcher or a community partner uh, who we know is engaged and invested in the work uh, that makes it more compelling. Um, we found that when we get researchers talking about their work, um, even topics that you know might be a bit boring uh, have the opportunity to come to life. Um, so we're able to share knowledge among um, community researchers and community members in a free, accessible, online, shareable way. Um, it, and it also moves really well through networks. It's easy to share. Um, we're able to tell interesting and meaningful stories. So telling a story is a huge part of developing a podcast episode. And using the voices and personality of the researchers and community partners is so important in that. Um, and then, you know, helping our audience understand content and, you know, we want to have robust and interesting content, but we need to present it in a way that people can understand and that they have a next step. They know how to use that knowledge and, and move forward with it. So those are some of the goals that we have um, with a research podcast and what we try to do with Handpicked. So podcasters are responsible to a lot of people. Um, when you're creating a podcast, uh, you know, we take very seriously our relationship with our listeners, our contributors, and our content. So we're sort of being pulled in three different directions all the time. Um, we aim to make podcasts that are interesting and informative, but, and don't ask too much of the listener. I mean, I'm sure that everyone can imagine the time when they've listened to something that, um, was so demanding of their attention or sounded so poorly that you just couldn't listen anymore. So we expect our listeners to be generous and a little forgiving of minor hiccups because again, we're a team of two and we're not the CBC. Our production level is as, as our very best job, um, but it's not super, super professional. Um, so we try to make sure that we're being economical with our words. We're not taking forever to get to the point. We're at least leveling our sound off and you know, aiming towards even higher standards of production value. And we hope that our listeners will come away having learned something. So Lane and I always get to the end of an episode and we listen to it all the way through um, after we've done all of our editing and all of our tweaking. And we try to make sure that we put ourselves in the shoes of our listeners or in the, the headphones of our listeners, I guess, um, to make sure that our listeners are getting something. We think that our listeners would be getting something if we were the listener um, from our, our episode. Um, we are really, really careful with our relationship with our contributors. Again, all of the work at the, the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems is done, uh, is based on trust with community partners. And we don't want to do anything to 
uh, disrupt that trust or to disrupt the trust that we've built with the researchers that we talk to. So it's extremely important that we never put words into anyone's mouths or that we make them sound anything less than as brilliant as they are. Um, everybody who we interview, I mean, everybody has something interesting to say, but everybody that we interview has something absolutely interesting to say, and we want to do our very best to present that. Um, we want to make sure that our contributors know that we've paid a careful attention to them as people and that we respect their work. So that means that we try to meet with people where they are, uh, and we always give them an opportunity to give us feedback before our episode goes out into the world. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in front of a mic, but it is a very vulnerable place to be. Um, and we do our very best to respect that our contributors have um, been very generous with their time and, and really gone out on a limb. Uh, in terms of content, we are responsible for presenting true, accurate, and um, interesting content. So, I mean, we try to be as true to the research as we possibly can, and um, we safeguard that by um, being in contact with our, our contributors as well. Um, so we, we honor all three of those um, responsibilities by working in full cooperation with the researchers and communities uh, involved in our, in our episodes to bring their vision and their research to life. Um, I also want to throw a, an additional um, responsibility into the mix here, and that is that like Lane and I are also responsible to ourselves as, uh, and to the LCSFS as, um, as podcasters. So we do our very best to make podcast episodes that we can be very proud of. Um, so sometimes that means that it takes longer than we anticipated. We've definitely gone back to the drawing board a couple of times um, or re-recorded content or had to really put the brakes on an episode and say, okay, our original vision was this, but what we collected, the audio that we collected gave us this. How are we going to tell this new story that's emerged that we didn't expect? Um, and that takes time and patience and a real give and take between the two of us as well. Um, we also have had to say, uh, this is good enough. Um, we know that our episodes will never be absolutely perfect and that's okay. So um, sometimes we get to the end of an episode and we say, oh gosh, we wish we had done this better. Well, we take that as learning for next time and we say, this is, this is where we are and this is, um, this is good because we put our hearts into it. Um, so in the first season of Handpicked, um, we did a lot of exploring of the different ways that researchers imagine research and impact sustainable food systems. Um, it includes, our first season includes six episodes with stories about what sustainable food systems are, how we measure and manage food over time, um, how big agreements like, uh, big international agreements like the sustainable development goals play out in food policy at the local level, um, how technology is important for small scale farmers and how an indigenous community in the Northwest Territories is using sustainable food systems research to build the food system they want. So it's a pretty wide ranging first season. Um, if you have listened to the whole, uh, listened to all six episodes, you'll know there was a very different, um, different use of voice and of um, podcast format between say episode two, where we talk about um, measuring sustainable food systems versus episodes three and four, when uh, our, our researcher Andrew was in, co in direct conversation with indigenous uh, community partners in the Northwest Territory. So th they sound a little bit different, um, but we always use uh, narration and um, sort of structured storytelling to make sure that our listener has the context they need and are guided through the episode in a way that makes sense for them. Um, all of our episodes are available through Libsyn, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can subscribe to the podcast or download individual episodes. Um, we also engage with listeners, contributors, and others through social media, um, which takes a lot of time, but is actually um, is helping us to really build robust networks of folks who are interested in our podcast and to to get our podcast out to um, people that wouldn't normally encounter it. So that's pretty cool. 
Um, we also have uh, show notes and teaching tools uh, for each episode, and we're going to be continuing to develop those, and you can access those on the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems website. So podcasting, I, I, I suspect that you've probably gathered that podcasting is not particularly easy. Um, you can just record something and throw it up online and call it a podcast. Um, but that's not the um, that's not where we're coming at podcasting from. The podcasting, the research podcasting that we do that really showcases work that's being done in communities requires writing, editing in both print and audio, recording, interviewing, scripting, sound engineering, marketing, and social media skills. So and all sorts of other things as well. Um, and not all research or researchers are made for podcasts. Um, again, I'm, I'm sure that you've heard someone talk who you thought, oh gosh, I can't listen beyond this five minutes. And, and that's okay. Sometimes podcasts aren't the right fit for everybody. Um, and recording can be a real issue. Uh, it's time consuming. And if you don't get good audio, um, fixing it in the editing stage is, is just um, sometimes not even an option at all. Um, so it's important to us to talk to researchers and community partners before we even jump into creating a podcast. That way we know we can sort of assess some of the challenges that we might come up against and really try to figure out what the story is before we start. Just randomly collecting audio is, is not really what we do because, um, again, we don't have a team of sound engineers who can um, help us figure out what to do with that with that work. So um, technical issues though, I think are, um, they can be overcome. And uh, if, if, you, if you think you've got a good story and you have research that you really wanna get out into the public and you don't mind making some mistakes, then podcasting can be really, really rewarding. Um, content travels to new audiences, episodes go to new places uh, in new and interesting ways. And talking with researchers as a curious interviewer is super rewarding. I That's the best part of my job, is um, being in a room with, uh, with researchers who are passionate about their work and trying to figure out how to ask them the right questions to get them to tell me the story that is buried there under all the jargon and um, all of the details. Um, and writing and editing, even though they can be painful, are, you know, can be satisfying in their own way as well. So, um, because we likely have a wide audience here today, um, the tips that I'm going to give for sharing your research are a bit varied. Um, some are targeted more towards people wanting to share their own research, and some of these are more for folks like Amanda and I that also want to help other people tell their stories. So. Um, when you're sharing your research through through podcasting, it's important to to keep it simple and and, and short-ish, as it says there. Uh, researchers have a lot to say about their research. If anybody's been to an academic conference, you know that. Um, so it's important as producers and as hosts for Amanda and I to help folks tell their story by, you know, asking more direct and simple questions. Um, you know, if someone uh, has gone on for a, a while, asking some clarification, uh, there's often a simpler way to say things. And we can, if we ask the right questions, we can get that out. And, you know, one of the ways we've found to be really successful in, in helping folks to um, come out of the academic uh, sphere and into the everyday language is to just describe a typical day. So you might say, okay, so you're out in the field, um, you're up in Kakisa, you're working with the community. Uh, what does your what does your typical day look like? What do you what do you do? And it helps people to think about things in a little bit of a different way. Because often as academics, we end up with a script that we repeat over and over again, and we want to get people out of that. We want to hear something um, more of a story and more of their voice. Um, and speaking about voices, um, you know, you want to make sure you're engaging with different voices, not too many, because you don't want to complicate the story or not know who's speaking uh, in each uh, in each episode. But you don't want just to be monotonous and, and, and you know, not provide um, varied perspectives. So uh, you want to find a balance of perspectives and voices that um, can tell your story. And that can be, you know, including say community partners that you might be working with, or it could be 
If you're um, a, a PI, you could include a student that you're working with that might have a different perspective on that research. Um, just a quick little caveat, um, if you do plan on using um, research partners in an our active uh, research project, you will need to uh, speak with the Research Ethics Board at your university. Um, podcasting is new, but uh, research ethics boards are aware of them and they want to make sure that um, everything is still ethical. So sometimes it requires a, a small um, edit to your research ethics um, in order to, to include certain folks in something like podcasting. So just keep that in mind um, and you know, communicate with your research ethics board. Um, so another tip for um, sharing your research is to actually go and take a microphone into the field with you. So um, if you've listened to any of our episodes, we try to include sounds from some of the areas that we've been or some of the areas that our research um, includes. So, uh, you know, we'll have something at the beginning that is actually a sound from the area or, you know, there's been times where we've interviewed folks actually in the field, uh, which provides a really cool aesthetic to the to the podcast um, but it also brings forward challenges because you want to make sure that you're you can hear what's happening over background noise um, and so it's very important to pay attention to to sound quality and that can be challenging when you're first starting out so give yourself the time and the space to to test it out you know stand in the field speak say something, listen to it, and see what it sounds like. And that goes for when you're also having um, conversations in, you know, a recording studio or an office space. Uh, you want to test everything out because if you do an entire interview and there's a weird buzzing in the background, um, it can be, it can end your ability to tell that story um, if you don't know how to get rid of it because um, people can't often listen if there's something challenging like that in the back. So be really careful, test it out, and you know, make sure that uh, your microphones are set up in a way that uh, collects sound, but is also comfortable for, for people to, uh, to sit and speak to, because it can be um, a bit scary to, to sit down and uh, have a conversation with someone that's being recorded. Um, you wanna make sure you're prioritizing a story. So we always wanna, um, what Amanda and I do is, you know, we have an idea of either a, either a research project we want to work with or a specific researcher, and we sit down and we say, you know, what story do we want to tell? And how do we tell it? And that's what we start from when we're developing every episode. We want to make sure there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, um, and that listeners really um, take something from it and also, you know, know where to get more information at the end if we've really piqued their interest. We want to make sure that um, these stories, when they're told, um, can, can continue to move forward because that's a big part of, um, you know, disseminating research, which is what we're, we're trying to do. Um, so when you're thinking about writing a script or um, editing sound and um, different uh, audio clips, you want to make sure you're, well, in this case, what we do is we write for an educated and interested listener. So, um, you know, we're not trying to speak only to academics. Um, you know, many of our family members have listened to this podcast and understood what's going on. Um, so you don't want to oversimplify so that, you know, your audience kind of feels like you're talking down to them, but you also really want to um, make sure that your, the research is able to be understood in a story and, um, you know, uh, is something that someone would want to listen to. That's the biggest thing. If no one wants to listen to it, it's not going to help you in disseminating your research. Um, something we found really helpful for us is engaging on social media. So, um, you know, we, we have a Twitter account, we have a Facebook, some of our folks, um, our community partners engage more through Facebook. So we'll use that, um, that as a means to share things. Uh, you know, we will make, we'll take quotes from our episodes and we'll put them up on, on cards with photos and we'll share that on Twitter to really engage. Um, and yeah, if you are, you can retweet some of the researchers that you're working with or different podcasters, you can tag who you're interviewing in your posts and it really helps to engage with their network as well. Um, you wanna share your work with different networks. So often we're all involved in many networks. Uh, this is something that can be easily sent out like you would um, with an academic publication to your, to your network. So you can send this podcast out in a way um, uh, to allow people to know what you're up to. Uh, there's 
sometimes it's easier if you're commuting to listen to a podcast than it is to find um, to read an academic paper when you have a folder on your computer that's to read that has about 50 in it. We all know what that's about. Um, so uh, finally, it's important to get feedback and, and adapt. So um, we're just working on a process of more, a more formal evaluation of our first season so that we can um, make some changes to our next season um, in response to some of that feedback and make sure that we're um, you know, responsible to those people Amanda spoke about earlier, so our audience and our researchers um, and ourselves. And, um, but it doesn't have to be formal. You can do this in an informal way. So say if you share your podcast episode out and people hear it and they say, oh, I listened to it, blah, blah, blah. Ask them some questions, you know, get some feedback on it so that you know uh, what you might want to do different next. And then just a quick little tip. Um, the podcasting process, as, as Amanda has highlighted, is not something that's easy. Uh, both of us have had previous podcasting experience prior to um, coming into Handpicked. But there's often times where something comes up and we have no idea how to deal with it because audio is fickle. So um, it's important if you if you don't know how to do something, there's something going wrong, Google it. The podcasting community out in the world is huge. There are so many um, YouTube videos. Many libraries right now are offering like 101 podcasting courses. Um, Amanda and I have been to a few courses at the Kitchener Public Library that have been really helpful. Um, and because of COVID-19, things have been moving, you know, more towards online spaces, which has made sometimes makes things more accessible to to uh, everyone. So uh, you're very, it's very easy to find a solution to your problems. You just have to take the time to to do so. Um, one of the really interesting things about podcasting, um, and in our particular format of podcasting is that like there, there's not really any rules, right? We figure out what we want each episode to look like. And that sort of speaks to Lane's point as well of, of like figuring out creative ways to deal with whatever um, challenges pop up in a podcasting practice. So um, if what we're talking about doesn't sound like a podcast that you would produce or that you, the researchers that you work with would produce, that's okay. Um, there are uh, endless ways to figure out what a podcast might sound like. Um, and the best way to do that is to just listen to some podcasts and, and, and go from there. So, but we do have a few components of a good research story that we really try to incorporate into all of our episodes. Um, the very first is that it's told in a personal voice. Um, again, if you've heard one of our episodes, it actually would sound quite a bit like this webinar where Lane and I are in conversation with each other and moving back and forth between um, our, the people that we are chatting with, um, providing context and um, uh, and asking questions of each other. Um, and we ask that everybody that we interview also really use, uh, really, we try to let their personalities come through. And we encourage them uh, to make mistakes and to embrace their own um, verbal tendencies. I say interesting a whole lot. We're always trying to edit out when I say, oh, wow, that's interesting. And that's okay. That's just part of, you know, that's part of my personality. Um, we always try to make some links to current events or everyday context so that listeners can see themselves in the, the episodes. And we ground, if, if this doesn't come up in our interviews, if we're not able to tease that out from the researchers, we do this through narration. Um, and uh, it also allows us to take um, information that we may have gathered, uh, audio that we may have gathered um, a few months ago or even a year ago and relate it to current context. Um, passion about a project is super important, and this is why we love talking directly with researchers and community partners, um, because when you hear a research say something like this, this is what I want to do with the last phase of my life, as Teresa does in our most recent episode, it's just like podcasting gold. It's just incredible, and it like gives me goose pimples, and it's just so wonderful, and that's the kind of thing that really resonates with listeners and and helps people to really understand when when i'm excited about something i know that people around me get excited about it as well and same goes for podcasting um, again we really uh try to be in conversation and it's conversation among researchers and partners and the hosts for sure but we also try to imagine our listeners as part of that conversation so you'll often hear us speaking to the listener or like 
pretending that the listener is in the room. Um, and this has been a really effective way for us to make sure that we're grounding our uh, narration in uh, listener experience. Relatable content, obviously, is a really important uh, and a really important part. And we've talked quite a bit about uh, good quality sound and music. So making sure that your content is understandable and that people can relate to it and that your sound quality is decent and that you've incorporated music or sounds or whatever you want to incorporate in uh, in an effective way is important for respecting uh, the your the ability of your your listener. Again, it's a it's a generous listener for sure. But if your podcast sounds terrible and is super boring, people aren't going to listen to it. So we're going to really quickly because we'd like to leave a little time for um, for questions. I realize we're we're getting up to the end of our time here, um, but we'd like to. Uh, have just a couple of clips or share a couple of clips from our latest episode. We are all shepherds of the data, food, technology, and data sovereignty, which features uh, Dr. Teresa Schumelis, who's the director of the Open Food Network Canada. Um, and Lane's going to walk you through the episode just a little bit. Um, just we're going to give you some of the key concepts and then uh, give you a chance to hear what that sounds like in our um, in our episode. Okay, so um, again, uh, some of the ideas that we talk about in this podcast are um, a, a bit large, so I'll try to speak a little bit to um, you know what what is a, a what is food sovereignty, what is tech sovereignty. Um, but again, this is something you know you might want to listen to the episode to hear more about because we will be able to speak about it in a way that makes a little bit more sense. But um, this episode, as Amanda said, features um, Dr. Teresa Schumelis, who's uh, a partner of the Laurier Centre for Sustainable Food System, um, and she works with Open Food Network Canada, which um, is a it's an open source software platform, and you might not know what that means because we sure didn't before we sat down with her, but basically Open Food Network uh, helps people who produce um, and uh, process food it helps them get their food to consumers. So it's an online way of um, buying and selling local goods. Um, and it's done so in a way that promotes food sovereignty and technological sovereignty, which um, is something we'll speak a little bit more about or hear a little bit more about from Teresa. So we'll just have her quickly introduce herself so you can see sort of this is one of the um, one of sorry, the computers a little silly. Um, it's one of the ways that we have uh, folks engage with our uh, guests as well. So um, the sound is not perfect here, um, but bear with us. Um, it sounds better on the podcast episodes. Uh, my name is Teresa Shimalas. I'm a retired uh, academic and a activist in food systems and now in technology. And I am a small scale cut flower grower in Southwest Ontario. Okay, so um, again, like I said, Teresa is gonna speak a bit about food sovereignty and tech sovereignty. She's going to talk about open source data and code, which you may think has nothing to do with food, but it really does. Um, we uh, have learned so much in developing this episode. Um, she speaks about the importance of having community in food systems, uh, especially sustainable food systems. And she talks about working as an activist with um, within an entirely new community for her, um, which is the coder community, which we'll hear a little bit more about. Uh, my name is Teresa Shamaroff. I'm a... There we go. Okay, so I'll let Teresa, um, I'll, I'll let you hear from our podcast what food sovereignty is, because um, Amanda and I speak a bit about it in the episode. Teresa and I talked about why she considers digital sovereignty as key to food sovereignty. And by food sovereignty, you mean people's right to healthy, culturally appropriate, and sustainably produced food, and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems, right? Exactly. You may have heard the term food sovereignty in discussions around sustainable food systems, but it's important to know that the term comes from a farmer's organization in the Global South called La Via Campesina. The Via Campesina coordinates peasant organizations of small and middle scale producers, agriculture workers, rural women and indigenous communities, and advocates for family farm based sustainable agriculture. La Via Campesina works on projects that defend farmer seeds, stop violence against women, recognizes the rights of peasants, and campaigns for agrarian reform at the global level. Oh, wow, that's incredible. 
It really is. And I think it's especially interesting to see how the ideals of food sovereignty have been adapted in different ways to different contexts, even in the digital context. That's right. So you'll see um, Amanda and I use narration as a way to, you know, introduce a topic like food sovereignty. And then here we'll hear Teresa link food sovereignty to technological sovereignty. I asked Teresa to spell out the relationship between food sovereignty and tech sovereignty for me. Here she is. Well, you know, they're both sovereignty. So they're, they're, they're both about um, decision making. One is about decision making around the food system. One is about decision making around technology. But they both happen in community. Um, they're both perpetuated by community and can't exist without community. Um, and I guess the reason I put them together is because increasingly they're one and the same thing. Because I think we can't have in today's age, we can't have food sovereignty without tech sovereignty because all everything about our food system today is embodied in code. It's embodied digitally. So Teresa makes links between food sovereignty and something called, you know, tech or data sovereignty through this open, uh, open source platform that they use called Open Food Network. Um, and this, this project um, enables many of the aspects of sustainable food systems that we've spoke about before, like social justice, local economic vitality, and citizen engagement. So um, we can really start to see how um, promoting food sovereignty and tech sovereignty can uh, also promote sustainable food systems. I asked Teresa to spell out the relationship between <laughs> Sorry, these the audio clips whenever I try to change. Teresa and I talked to, there we go. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, the reason why we chose to make this episode with Teresa um, is for many reasons, but we're familiar with Teresa's work. Um, we've worked with her before. Uh, we have some, you know, knowledge about what she's talking about. Um, and she also agreed to work with us, which is really important. We always want to collaborate and co-produce with our researchers. Um, the topic is timely and it's interesting um, and you know online food markets are something that a listener might have encountered but we can actually present that information in a new way. Um, the Open Food Network is a tangible example. We're always looking for ways to help um, our listeners understand what a sustainable food system is and how they might be able to affect change in their own food systems and o Open Food Network gives us a, a tangible example of how that can happen um, and simply we're uh, Teresa was nearby. She lives uh, in St. Agatha, so um, it's a short drive for us to go and interview her in the community in her on her farm, um, so, which is something you need to think about. And then finally, there's a really good story here. Um, we lucked out because Teresa um, is a person who has the capacity to tell a good story and is so passionate about her work. And I will play one final clip that illustrates that, um, that shows sort of um, some of the reasons why we do what we do. There is something so completely different about this particular community that I'm part of, that than from any community I've ever been part of, um, that it's um, vibrant and exciting and uh, integrated. The different parts of their lives are, are I don't know, it's, uh, there's just something quite different and I, I'm, I know I'm floundering for words because I haven't, I can't kind of name the experience yet. Um, but I, very early on when I first kind of started hanging out with the Open Food Network crew, um, you know, I came home and I said to Peter, like my husband, this, this is where I want to spend my retirement years. This is how my circle ends of life. I know this now. This is this is what I have been waiting for my entire life. I have been waiting for and trying other communities to get to this community. And how can one have that feeling? I've been in lots of global change communities, but I have not felt the hope and the excitement about um, system transformation. Um, like La Via Campesina really charged me, right? Like that was holy cow. But um, this was like double holy cow this this is going to go um the potential is just so unbelievable here um so yeah it's uh really um for me makes me wish i had started out as a coder or or something right 
So you can hear in this um, in this clip Teresa's passion for what she does, and it it really helps to connect the readers to the story um, that she's trying to tell. Um, and you know what's interesting about this particular episode is you know I went out to her farm last summer, so we recorded it about a year ago. Um, but we're in an entirely different situation in 2020 right now uh, with COVID-19 and, and um, all of the major changes that we've seen. So we were able to um, adapt the episode to, to fit that. So, you know, we talk about how the Open Food Network is helping, um, you know, everybody move online when they need to because we couldn't be in person together. Um, so Open Food Network is helping everybody from the producers to the consumers adapt to living in a, in a pandemic. Um, so it was really easy to build that into our narrative and to tell um, not only Teresa's story, but also a story that was relevant to, to right now. There's some. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. And I'm sorry that we haven't left a ton of time for questions, but we would want to start by just thanking you for listening. Um, we always are so grateful um that anyone would like to tune in to hear what we we have to say um, and we'd love to open the floor up for questions if you have any okay thank you both for your incredible presentation we do have a few questions here from the audience and just a reminder to everyone there is a question tab in your webinar control panel where you can submit uh, questions and we will get the answers for you i also wanted to just do a little shout out teresa who you were just mentioning who owns Garden uh, Garden Party in uh, St. Agatha. She's actually doing the flowers for my wedding and does really beautiful work. So just a quick shout out to a small business. Uh, <laughs> the first question we have here is actually uh, some feedback as well. So it says, thanks for your wonderful deep dive into podcasting and how it can help researchers to tell their stories. Uh, this was very engaging and inspiring. I love how you made this so accessible and less intimidating. Um, I love listening to your hand-picked podcast. How would you suggest a person get started if they want to tell their story about their research? What are the first steps? I would say the first step is to um, really think about the story that you want to tell and go in and rent yourself a field mic. You can get a Zoom mic, which is what we use at uh, when we record uh, in the field. Uh, you can get something like that uh, for a couple of days for $12 at Long and McQuaid. Um, and I would say jump in. Uh, if you have an opportunity to do some recording and to think about how you might tell your story, the best way to figure out if you're going to be able to do that effectively is to to try to to try to think it through and try to try to do it. Um, and if you can find a course, as Lane mentioned, we we took a course at the uh, the Kitchener Public Library. Um, that a, a little bit of learning is not a, a bad place to start either. And if you're a if you're a Laurier um, adjacent person, there are also the research offices doing a lot of work to promote podcasts right now as well. So I'm assuming that um, our capacity to um, learn more about podcasting is going to increase. And whenever we can be back in person, they've also uh, developed a recording studio in the library. So there's um, some some space there as well. Oh, that's actually a good thing to note too, is that some libraries now have recording spaces that aren't accessible right this second, but um, some public libraries also have those recording spaces that you can access uh, yeah, for Kitchener, free. Kitchener Public Library has three or so recording booths that you can rent for free um, once we're able to be in person again. <laughs> okay, well, highly relevant to those comments then. We do have a question here that says, have you recorded any podcasts during the pandemic, working remotely? Uh, what are the challenges in that process rather than recording with a participant in person? That's a great question. Um, we haven't had to record uh, with a with a collaborator or, a or an interviewee at this point. So far, um, we had to uh, record all of the narration and do all of the editing for uh, our our latest episode um, during the pandemic, and that was a bit of a challenge for Lane and I, but we have mics um, that we have access to and we um, are used to recording. So it, it wasn't a huge challenge. Actually, wait, that's not true. We had to re-record some, uh, some clips. And it, that, <laughs> yeah, I've <definitely>. totally forgotten. <laughs> definitely a learning curve that comes yeah. from um, the fact that Amanda and I no longer sit in the same room. Um, but 
our most recent episode and even the episode before were both uh, recorded from individual mics while we just sat over Zoom and, and chatted. And uh, I, I would like to say I can't tell a difference in the audio um, with a lot of work and practice and <laughs> figuring it all out. So. Well, that is also partly due to your patience and skill in editing, right? So um, I think it, it's totally doable. And the other thing that we have done with these episodes is to tell our listener, hey, listener, things are changing for us because we can't be together in person. So we appreciate your patience, um, but we're going to tell this story anyway. Um, and I, I think that's been really successful again, partly because of, of Lane's editing skill, but if you have time and patience, you can, you can do a lot with different, uh, different quality of sound and different sounds from different places. Um, and that's not really a barrier for us anyway, because we always record in different places, not always, but quite often record in, different places. So um, for the most current episode, um, uh, Lane um, interviewed Teresa on her farm, and then we recorded narration later in our homes. But for the very first episode, it's a, mo it's a collage of sound collected from, uh, oh gosh, I want to say uh, over a dozen contributors in different places. So as long as you can walk your uh, interviewee through how to record on their phone or on their computer, or if you can record over Zoom or something like that, uh, you, you can overcome the barriers. It's it's not a humongous barrier because um, difference in sound is not the worst thing ever. No, it's okay. You know, if you listen to the CBC, for example, um, you'll hear if they're interviewing people in the field, you'll hear a different sound quality, right? So you just have to make sure you introduce that. And honestly, we we do have some experience. We recorded some things with Allison where she just used her iPhone. And while we were all on Zoom, we each had our microphone, she had her iPhone in front of her, and then she sent us the file and it was totally fine. So, you know, don't use technology, don't think of technology as a huge barrier. Um, with what we have right now, there's a lot of ways to work around it. You just have to test it out and try it. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, it definitely makes it a little less intimidated to getting to getting started here. So, the next question we have here from one of our webinar participants is: uh, Sustainable food systems is a very broad topic. So, how do you narrow your scope and determine what direction you're going to take on each of the podcasts? Lane, do you want to take this one? feel like you're better handled to do this one. <laughs> <laughs> we really let our, um, we think about, so as we're developing our second season, we are thinking about um, the topics that we would like to cover. And um, we're trying to think of topics that are a little bit different than um, our first season. And once we determine what those topics are, and they're very high level, very broad, say, um, as an example, um, biodiversity or food and pedagogy, or um, uh, food. more, food, sorry, food technology, right? Oh my gosh, or Lane's um, food and gender in keto. Um, we start with these very broad topics, but then we talk to the researchers and the community partners and we let that drive the story. So we may, um, often we will sit down with a researcher that we've said, hey, we'd like to make this podcast. Um, are you interested? And let's do a like a pre-interview or, or a pre-discussion and let's try to figure out what that story is before we do the recording. And then from there, we collect the, the audio and um, then we build a story around, this, around the audio that we actually collect. So we make sure that folks um, have the opportunity to tell us about their research. So we try not to really drive, be really heavy, head, heavy handed in driving the story. And, and when you think about some of our tips that we've given, you know, sometimes you just have to make that decision based on who you can have access to. Um, so, you know, we tell different stories within, the, within what a sustainable food system is because those are the people that want to tell the story and the people that we have access to. So sometimes you have, are limited by that as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're a researcher trying to figure out what research story you might tell, um, that's really tricky. Uh, but you know your research the best. So um, I think that there are ways to figure out what story you can bring bring forward by thinking about 
um, what writing you've done or what presentations you've given or you know when you talk to your family and friends what they respond to so uh, I think it's just doing some real thinking about um, what the little nugget is in all of the the larger um, information larger sets of information that we're gathering as researchers Hey, excellent. I know we're uh, we're past time right now, but hopefully you don't mind uh, sticking around for a few more questions that we have from our participants. Sure. Okay, great. So the next question here is, you mentioned that you have responsibilities uh, to many different people when creating these podcasts. Uh, going through each of your sessions, do you review how you're answering the questions from different perspectives and stakeholders to ensure that uh, that you're meeting those responsibilities? That's a good um, question. That's a good question. Um, I think that's something that um, is always in the back of our mind, but again, we are dealing with with some access issues, right? Um, and 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 limitations with the fact that we try to keep these podcasts between thirty and forty five minutes. Um, so yeah, sometimes sometimes there'll be a perspective that um, might. Uh, be overshadowing other potential perspectives, but that's also why we have um, resources and uh, the capacity to engage on social media so that we can have more of those conversations that might be brought up from our from our podcast episodes. We also talked a little bit about the um, our responsibility to our contributors as being um, really important to us. Uh, and I think that it's worth noting again that we make sure that we give all of our contributors uh, access to the draft podcast before it goes out. So nothing has left our uh, home studios without approval from the people who are uh, whose voices we're featuring. Uh, and that's really important to us because um, we would hate for someone to feel like we've re represented them in the wrong way uh, or um, unfairly or anything like that. So we take that responsibility seriously when we're producing the podcast, but we also actively um, engage with our contributors to ask for their feedback and we adapt based on that feedback. Um, so similar to how you would in a research project. You yeah. know, you, if you're doing community-based research, you're going to come up with some themes and some takeaways and you want to bring that back to the community to make sure that those takeaways are what they meant for you to take away. And we do the same with the podcast. And when we think about our, our, our responsibility to ourselves um, and to our listeners, we ask our, feed, our, we ask our listeners for feedback. We ask, and often this is like family and friends, we can ask the best, uh, the most for their most honest answers. Um, but then Lane and I often sit down and say, okay, what, what went well and what didn't work? Like, okay, so we're starting a new, a new episode. We're not doing that thing again because that didn't work or that took us triple the amount of time we thought or was exhausting or whatever. So we're trying to be in constant conversation between the two of us as well to, to make sure that we're um, uh, being true to ourselves and our listeners. Okay, excellent. The next question we have here is, do you complement your podcast with blogs? Or do you have any insights on doing that? We, that's a great question. Um, so right now what we have are show notes for our, uh, every episode includes show notes that um, have a, a description and links to other resources, uh, links to all of the contributors. Uh, and we have um, discussion questions uh, that we imagine uh, as being, uh, we imagine um, podcasts is a really interesting teaching tool and we're trying to talk about that a little bit more um, and we have a glossary um, we are going to be doing a blog post coming up um, Lane this is new to you sorry I agreed to it um, <laughs> about um, about the season as a whole and it's reflecting on the season our first season um, and we've done a few uh, media interviews and that sort of thing so the podcast isn't the only uh, thing that we're producing. We're sort of producing um, research outputs. No, I guess they're not really research outputs, but outputs. So blog posts and social media posts and and teaching tools and uh, resource packages, those sorts of things, uh, and presentations. Um, we're we're always sort of looking for new ways to do that. But I would think I would say that um, I mean I can 
from my personal experience, I think um, having a blog post to complement uh, um, a podcast episode is a great idea because it gives written form to um, something that is going to be put out into the um, audio world, right? So you already have that content. There's no reason not to create different um, different outputs with that content. Um, it, it really helps to reach as many audiences as possible. Um, again, keeping in mind your, your responsibility to um, the community partners or to the researchers that you interview. Um, but I think that those are, uh, blog posts are a really interesting way to make sure that the information travels even farther. Okay, fantastic. We have one more question for the two of you. So this last question says, thank you for sharing all of your insights. In addition to your podcast, are there any others on the topic of sustainable food systems that you would recommend to supplement our learnings? Oh my goodness. That's a great question. <laughs> there, there aren't a ton um, of specifically sustainable food system podcasts, which is I think why we are developing what we're doing. Um, Amanda, do you can you think of any specific examples? No, not off the top of my head. But you know what, I I would be happy um, for the person to, who asked that question to contact us separately, and we can put together. Um, I, I can do a little bit of digging. Um, but this is a really interesting question because I, I I can't think of. There's lots of food podcasts. There's tons of food podcasts, but sustainable food podcasts um, or sustainable food system podcasts. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, and I mean we've. There's a few CBC um, specials on um, food insecurity, for example. There's one called Hard to Stomach, which I don't know that I would necessarily recommend, but it is definitely some listening. So there are some specials that come up through CBC as well. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know that there is a specific podcast out there right now dealing with food system, sustainable food system issues specifically. But we will uh, keep keep looking for that, and maybe people will let us know after this. Yes, if you know of one, please let us know because we'd love to listen and we'd love to connect. We're always looking to connect with other podcasters. Okay, fantastic. So those are all the questions that we have today. Uh, but before we go, Lane and Amanda, is there anything that you wanted to add? No, just thanks everyone for sticking around. I know we're 12 minutes over, so we really appreciate your attention and your generosity with your time. Okay. Uh, yes, again, thank you to our attendees for your participation. Thank you to Lane and Amanda for being so generous with your time. Uh, I hope that everyone has a few key takeaways to apply from this presentation and will join Laurier alumni for some of our other upcoming virtual events. I'm also happy to share that we have an, a new great way to reconnect. Uh, interacting with others can boost feelings of well-being, so we encourage you to reconnect with your former classmates through hosting a reunion on Zoom. So we're calling these Resumians. Um, <laughs> let us know how you'd like to connect and who you want to connect with, and we'll help you in all the planning pieces. So if you're interested, visit laurieralumni.ca backslash resumians. So that's R-E-Z-O-O-M-I-O-N-S for more information. And uh, I thank you again for spending your time with us today and for staying connected to Laurier. I hope the rest of you enjoy the rest of your day and that you'll stay golden. Take good care. <laughs>